Welcome Here are today's everybody. top crime so stories trending on Long Island. Right now, I want to talk about this. This is the case that I want to talk about right now, Harvey Weinstein. So as you just heard in that short preview, Harvey Weinstein is expected to surrender to police in Manhattan, and he faces charges in connection with the rape of one woman and the, uh, forcing another woman to perform oral sex on him. So what is going to happen logistically to this man? Let's bring in criminal defense attorney Yosha Gunasakara. Yosha, it's great to see you. It's great to be here. So explain to our viewers and our listeners exactly the process of what's going to happen to Weinstein. Sure. So he actually has already surrendered to the police, and there are photos out there right now of him being transported why did he do that? Why did he surrender? He surrendered because he found out, he was informed, that the prosecution, the district attorney of Manhattan, was seeking to prosecute him on rape and other related charges. So instead of waiting for the police to come with a warrant and, and try to arrest him at his home or on the street or wherever, he decided to voluntarily turn himself in. It involves coordination with the police in why, order why, to do that. Why didn't he leave the country? He, he could have, and, and we see other criminal defendants do that, but Pull that, Roman Polanski. that he would never be allowed to return to the United States because there would be an active warrant out for his arrest. As soon as he set foot on American soil, he would get arrested. Also, if he tried to flee, he could be extradited. If he uh, flee to Europe or another country, they could just send him back. So it would be a really risky move, and it also would look to most people like he was guilty if he did that. So he is charged with first degree rape, third degree rape in one case, as well as first degree criminal sexual act in another case, and he's defending himself. Isn't that a reason he wanted to stay too? Isn't aren't his attorney saying he never had non-consensual sex? He is saying that he is completely not <laughs> guilty, that they will fight this case, and that is another reason that he is cooperating with the police at this time. Does he stay in jail? Is he out on bond? What, what happens? So this is a really interesting case. In New York City, uh, judges can set bail on people, or they can release them on their own recognizance. Oftentimes, in more serious cases like this case, they're going to set bail. What's really interesting is they pre-negotiated bail here. And why that's really interesting is that never happens. Yeah, we, there was a statement from the NYPD. They said Harvey Weinstein was arrested, processed, and charged with rape, criminal sex acts, sex abuse, and sexual misconduct for incidents involving two separate women. The NYPD thanks these brave survivors for their courage to come forward and seek justice. The arrest and ensuing charges and the, are the result of a joint investigation between the NYPD and the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Additional information will be provided as it becomes available. When could we see a trial? It's going to be many, many months, if not a year or more down the road. There's a long process here. Uh, first, he's going to get he's going to get arraigned, which basically just means they're going to tell him formally of the charges against him. And then from there, there's a very long process of discovery, of filing motions, just a lot of behind the legal uh, behind the scenes legal action that is going to be taken on behalf of both the defense and the prosecution. I'm sure a lot of people are looking at this and saying Harvey Weinstein has been accused of sexual misconduct throughout the whole world and, and so many different accusations. Why are these two women able to come forward and their, their, their stories are being able, able to use to prosecute him? Oftentimes, a district attorney will look at instances that they are most easily able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. There's a variety of reasons why other women were not necessarily chosen for this. It's because maybe the case was very old. Maybe there's less evidence. These are two of the stronger cases that they have evidence for. And it's not to say that they won't try to bring in other instances if they are able to do so legally in a trial. And, you know, do we expect a situation like in Cosby, where even though it's about two women right here, you can have all these other women come forward and say, in court, in open court, be witnesses and say, Harvey Weinstein did this to me, he did this to me, he did this to me. Is that a possibility? It's a possibility. Obviously, his attorneys are going to oppose that, and they actually have some legal standing to oppose it. Uh, so it all depends. We, we don't know what's going to happen yet. And he's not just in trouble in New York State, right? Doesn't he face charges in other jurisdictions as well? He faces charges. Too, right? Yes, he faces charges in multiple areas and states, and essentially anywhere where these crimes have alleged to occur, there is something called jurisdiction, where those states and federal uh, courts have jurisdiction over him. They're able to prosecute him. 
And what's the worst thing that could happen to him? What's the maximum punishment he could receive if he's found guilty in connection with these crimes? I, he could face years in jail. Uh, rape is a very serious felony charge here. Uh, and there is a wide range, um, but he could face years. And if he's prosecuted on these other cases, all that time combined could result even in life in prison. That is pretty incredible to think about seeing this guy at the Oscars a few years ago and then think about him potentially being in a jail cell at some point. Um, we do want to let all of our viewers and our listeners know that we have an update about this. Um, Weinstein was led out of the NYTB, NYPD precinct in handcuffs. Again, pretty incredible stuff to think about this media mogul now where he faces, and it's going to be interesting to see how this case leads into other cases with other individuals, and also his story is just starting, right, Yosha? This is just the beginning of it. It is just the beginning. There is a long road ahead for Harvey Weinstein. Well, we are going to update you as soon as we have more about the Harvey Weinstein scandal, the Harvey Weinstein accusations. As soon as we have uh, more about this case, we'll make sure to let you know. In the meantime, <clears throat> we want to play you some more of the top crime stories of the day, in case you missed it. Take a look. Thanks, Anthony. Those are some great crime stories. You can learn more about them on lawncrime.com. But we want to switch gears right now because, we, as I said at the beginning of the program, we are going to recap one of the major cases that we covered here on Law and Crime. It is the George Birch case out of Wisconsin, a man who was on trial for the 2016 murder of a mother, a young mother, named Nicole Vanderheiden. Prosecutors said Birch violently beat sexually assaulted and strangled Vanderheiden with a cord. Now, all of our viewers, that is a picture of Miss Vanderheiden with her, her young baby right there. She was really a beautiful mother. But this is an interesting case for a lot of different reasons. You might think it's an open and shut case. The police arrested George Birch. They seem to have a lot of strong evidence against him. Not so fast, because his defense team said he had absolutely nothing to do with it. If you look at all of the evidence, we can explain why George Birch was where he was that night and why he says he had nothing to do with it. And you know why? Because he didn't commit this crime, the defense says. But Douglas Dietrich, Nicole's boyfriend, was the one that did it. Nicole, you're going to learn throughout this case, had a very interesting relationship with her uh, boyfriend, Douglas Dietrich. He actually took the stand in his own defense to explain what happened that night. But where we want to start right now is talking about the night that Nicole vanished, the night that the Nicole, the last time anybody saw her alive. And some of the first witnesses that were called were friends that went out with Nicole that night. They were drinking that night. They went to different bars. The first person I want to play for you is Aaron Kalinsky. He was a friend of Douglas Dietrich. Again, Douglas was Nicole's boyfriend. And I want you to really listen to their, the description about Nicole's relationship with Doug and what it was like that night when everything turned wrong. Take a look. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network, everybody, and Law and Crime on Sirius XM Radio. We are recapping the George Birch case out of Wisconsin for you, one of the most exciting cases we covered here on Law and Crime. This is about a man who was on trial for the first-degree intentional homicide of a young mother named Nicole Vanderheiden. This happened back in 2016. Nicole's body was found. It was, she was strangled, sexually assaulted, and it appeared to be she that she was strangled and she suffered blunt force trauma to the head and strangulation from a cord. What you're, we're doing right now is recapping this case for you, but we're not going to tell you what the verdict is until a little bit later on in the program. So what's, excuse me, what's happening here? Mr. Birch, who's the defendant, is claimed to have killed her. What we're learning right now is what Nicole was doing in the night that she disappeared, the night that this all happened. And what we just heard from Alan, Aaron Kalinsky, a friend of both the victim and the victim's boyfriend, Douglas Dietrich, they were all hanging out, they went out at a concert, they were drinking. But why does that matter? Let's bring back in uh, criminal defense attorney Yosha Gunasekera. Why does it matter how much she was drinking that night? Why does it matter if everybody else was drinking that night? It's very important to paint a picture of exactly what went down that night because the jurors need to know everything. And it seems like a lot of detail, but what happens later that night is her death. So it's important to understand the first couple of steps. And oftentimes when someone is killed, alcohol or drugs do play an important point. So. 
Well, we don't know where it's ultimately going at this point. We do know that she was drinking, that she might not have had the best judgment at that point, because we all know when you drink, it impairs your thinking abilities. And what's also important to point out here is, where is Douglas Dietry here? Right, let's talk about that. So we are going to, we have to take a quick break, but when we come back, Douglas Dietry is, as I said, Nicole's boyfriend. The defense said that George Birch didn't kill Nicole, but that it was Douglas, and under... This Aaron Kalinsky, who's being examined by the, who's being questioned by the prosecution, they're trying to see were Nicole and Doug fighting that night? Were they having a good time? We'll let you know more when we come back from the short break. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network and Law and Crime on Sirius XM Radio, Channel 109. I'm Jesse Weber, and I am guiding you right now through the George Birch case out of Wisconsin. This is a case that we covered extensively here on Law and Crime. And while we don't have our live trial today in the Sean Harrison case uh, that will return next week, we wanted to recap for you one of the major cases that we covered in a really bizarre but exciting case because you had a defendant here, George Birch, who was on trial for the first degree intentional homicide of a mother named Nicole Vanderheiden. But he said that he didn't do it that it was really Nicole's boyfriend, Douglas Dietrich. It should be noted, though, George Birch, uh, his DNA was found all over Nicole's body. Um, her body was found three miles uh, from her home in a ditch, and cell phone evidence tracked Birch to key locations that night, including where Nicole's body was found. Despite that evidence, though, George Birch says, I wasn't the one who did this. I was knocked out unconscious after fooling around with uh, Nicole after we met up at a bar. Douglas Dietrich, her boyfriend, knocked me in the head. He killed her and then forced me to get rid of her body. That is the story that the defense went with. And we are going to reveal later on in the program if that was successful. Did they jury come back with a guilty or not guilty verdict? We'll let you know. But we have to start from the beginning. And really, the beginning is what happened to Nicole that night. Well, what we're learning is that she was out with friends. They were drinking. She was out with her boyfriend, um, Douglas. But at one point, Douglas and her separated. Uh, they split apart. Now, we know that they were drinking that night. And the question became, how intoxicated was everybody? And more importantly, were Doug and Nicole fighting in the night in question? Because that's really what the defense wants to point out that they were fighting and that he really is the person that did this. Let's learn a little bit more about what happened that night between the two of them from Aaron Kalinsky, a friend of both the defend excuse me, a friend of both the victim and the victim's boyfriend. Let's look. Okay, we're learning a little bit more about what happened to the victim the night that she was killed. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network and Law and Crime on Sirius XM Radio Channel 109. I'm Jesse Weber. We are covering the George Birch case out of Wisconsin. This is a case that we covered extensively here on the network, and we are recapping it for you in its entirety. It was a very interesting case about a man who was charged with the first-degree intentional homicide of a young mother named Nicole Vanderheiden, who died, who was killed back in 2016. She suffered blunt force trauma to the head, strangulation with a cord, and also sexual assault. So the question became, what happened to Nicole the night, that night that she went missing? Well, what we're learning from Aaron Kalinsky, who was a friend of her boyfriend, um, again, her boyfriend, his name was Douglas Dietrich, and the reason I mention his name is because George Birch, the defendant, said that Douglas Dietrich is the one who killed her, not him. He had nothing to do with it. It was actually D uh, Douglas Dietrich. Now, here's the interesting thing. What we're learning from Aaron Kalinsky is that they were all drinking that night. Him, Nicole, some friends, Nicole's boyfriend, Doug. But they separated at one night. They separated at one point in the night. And there seemed to be a problem. There seemed to be a fight going on between Douglas and Nicole. In fact, she tried to call Doug at a certain point in the night, and he didn't pick up. And how did she know that? Because she had her friend call him, and he picked up his phone then. Now, why does this all matter? Let's talk a little bit more about it with criminal defense attorney Yosha Gunasekera. If I'm the defense, I'm happy to hear that, right? Because if you are your client's George Birch and you hear there's problems with Douglas Dietry and Nicole, it's looking good for them, right? There's a lot of good stuff happening here for the defense. In these type of cases, the finger is almost always pointed at someone the victim is having an intimate relationship with, which is Douglas Dietry in this case. That's why he was originally arrested. And so far, how the night is playing out is really making Doug Dietry not look good. Before Nicole is killed, they're having a fight, essentially. I mean, what makes more sense, right? A complete stranger killing her 
or somebody that she was intimate with, right? Isn't that the, really you target the boyfriend, the husband, the wife, the girlfriend? You look at the person that's intimate with somebody because they have the closest relationship with them. They have the most opportunity to be around them. And really what makes sense, if you have somebody that's been around her that night, and was fighting with her, in the eyes of the jury, they're listening very carefully to this. Exactly. If I'm a juror in this situation, this is really the start of reasonable doubt in this case. It's really pointing to another person other than George Birch. I mean, the fact that he is ignoring her calls, yet picks up a call from another woman, that, that's Yosha, not good. that's never good. It's never good. It's never, it's never good. good. Not even in murder cases, just in general. <laughs> yes. Um, but not to make light of it, here's, here's what we're going to play for you next. So Doug left one of those bars with his friend Greg. Greg became a key witness in this case. I want you to listen very carefully because Greg is going to describe to you the behavior of Douglas Dietrich, Nicole's boyfriend, right after they separated. Take a look. Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. We are recapping the trial of George Birch, a man who was on trial for the murder of Nicole Vanderheiden. She was murdered back in 2016. And despite really overwhelming evidence against Mr. Birch, including having uh, Ms. Vanderheiden's DNA all over him, cell phone evidence po pinpointing him to four key locations that night, including where her body was found, Mr. Birch and his defense team said he had nothing to do with it, that it was really Douglas Dietrich, Nicole's boyfriend at the time, who really killed her, and he's the one that the police should have gone after. But what are we learning about the night in question? We're learning that the night that Nicole ultimately died or disappeared, that she got into a fight with Douglas, and she ran off. She ran off by herself. Let's talk a little bit more about that with Yoshiguna Sakara. Douglas Dietrich was investigated by police, correct? He was investigated, but they didn't find anything, right? Yes, he was investigated and held for a number of days until... I think 18 days. Yes, um, which is significant until they found an alternative suspect, George Birch. But just because they didn't find anything in that investigation doesn't necessarily mean that he wasn't the one who did it. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it wouldn't preclude a jury from saying, hey, wait a second, maybe the police got it wrong here. You know, maybe they're not looking at it the way that they should. Maybe they saw Birch and they tried every which way just to get him. Um, because if you look at it, again, they got into a fight that night. And he didn't seem to care where she was. Exactly. And the defense can really spin this that once they got their hands on George Birch, they were going to dig in deeply on George Birch and not look at anybody else, not look at any kind of other evidence that would point to a different suspect. And that's one of the arguments that they're making here. They're trying to really develop this fact that Doug Dietrich was not in a good mood. He was harassing a bartender that night. According to his friend, they had gotten to this big argument. Those are things that can't be ignored. They didn't even bother to look for her outside of the bar. He just didn't care about her. He was drunk, angry, annoyed, even quite possibly smoking weed that night. Um, his facilities were distorted. I can't forget the fact that we've covered cases on here where you see people in perfect relationships and the husband or the wife has been found guilty of murder. Um, so you have an instance here where you have two people that seem to be in a very um, tense relationship that night or a tense uh, interaction. So it, it, the jury was listening to this. But who would be the best person to explain about their relationship? Douglas Dietrich himself. He took the stand. We are going to take a quick break here. When we come back, we're going to show you his testimony. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. This is Jesse Weber guiding you through the George Birch case right now. Now, who was on the stand? A man named Douglas Dietrich. And who is Douglas Dietrich? Well, George Birch was a man who was on trial for the 2016 murder of Nicole Vanderheide and this young mother. Douglas Dietrich was Nicole's boyfriend. Douglas Dietrich is the person that the defense is saying is actually her killer, not our client, not our client, George Birch. So when Douglas Dietrich had to take the stand, and he was put up there, and our viewers can see that side by side right there. On the right is Douglas Dietrich, on the left is George Birch. This became something everybody watched. How did Douglas Dietrich do on the stand? The way he moved, the way he talked, the way he looked, everything is being examined. So let me ask my, my expert on the set right now, criminal defense attorney Yoshi Gudasakara. If you're sitting in the jury and you are a great uh, criminal defense attorney, it's very important that when a, a witness comes on the stand that they're credible. How do you think he's doing when you're looking at him right there? Because he's an alternative suspect put forth by the defense. 
So far, he's doing okay. He's giving a background to his life together with Nicole. Uh, would you expect a little bit more emotion? Maybe. But so far, he's laying the groundwork. He's talking about the relationship. Um, it seems very, it seems a little stale, but so far, it's okay. Well, let's talk about that. So if he's not only talking about that his girlfriend was murdered by this man, George Birch, who the police arrested and now he's on trial for, but if he's being implicated by the defense as the real killer, wouldn't you want to see some emotion or does the jury look at that and say eh, I'm not believing any of it it's crocodile tears it's hard to say I mean everyone is so different um, you would expect to see some emotion but then this happened you know so many months ago so how he's processing now could be very different but you would think in his head he's probably nervous because he does understand that the juror, jurors might think that he's the actual real killer so I understand some of the nerves that are probably coming from him well who is the real killer what happened to Nicole that night okay that's what we're trying to understand and that's what the jury ultimately had to determine now again we are recapping this case and we will let you know what the verdict is but later on in the program so don't cheat don't look okay if you're a listener or watcher don't look yet we are recapping this case and we want to present it to you in a certain way so this is a continuation of Douglas Dietrich on the stand and now he's going to talk to you about what happened that the night Nicole walked off on her own and the next time anybody saw her she was dead in a ditch let's listen to that right now Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. What happened to Nicole Vanderheiden on the night in 2016? That's what we're trying to understand. George Birch was on trial for her murder, while his team and him were pointing the finger at Douglas Dietrich, the man that you were just listening and watching to, Nicole's boyfriend. Did he really kill her? That becomes the question. I want to bring on, real quick, Yoshiguna Sakara. This is a good-looking guy, I'm not going to lie. He's a good-looking guy, talking about with other women, too. Do you, how much does the jury just not like him, you know, just looking at him and being like, you know, this is a guy had a, was sharing children with her, was dating her, they lived together, and he's not picking up her phone calls. You know, it doesn't seem like a compassionate guy. He's not very likable, and you heard him testify. She's drinking a lot of alcohol, and she's drinking it quickly. And you would think a loving, caring boyfriend would be there to make sure that she was okay. Even when you're fighting, at the end of the day, you want to make sure the person you love is safe and cared for, and he just didn't do that. But how much is that just being a bad boyfriend, and how much is that really the start of a terrible night where he ultimately kills her? Exactly, and that's what the jurors have to sort out. It's it's going to be different. It's going to be difficult for them, and the, that's what the defense is really going to capitalize on. That he not only is uncaring, but he is a killer. The defense said that he knocked George Birch out because George Birch was uh, sleeping with Nicole in the night in question. Met her at a bar and was fooling around with her outside the home. George, uh, Douglas Dietrich knocks her out, knocks him out. When he wakes up, he already killed Douglas. Killed Nicole. So when the jury is looking at this man. They're looking at him to determine whether or not he is the killer. It's not just looking for credibility, not looking like we said about likability, but looking, is this man a killer or really is George Birch the killer? That becomes the question. That becomes the question for the jury. When we come back, we have a lot more to show you of Douglas Dietrich's testimony. We'll be back in a minute. Pretty incredible stuff right there. That was the arraignment of Harvey Weinstein. He has been arrested and processed in Manhattan on charges of rape, committing a criminal sex act, sexual abuse, and sexual misconduct. So what just happened during his arraignment? Let's talk more about it with criminal defense attorney Yosha Gunasakara. Yosha, what did we just learn from his, uh, his, his being processed in court? So we learned about his formal charges, but one of the most significant things here is it hasn't officially become a felony. It doesn't become a felony until a grand jury chooses to indict him. Essentially what that means, a grand jury is just a bunch of New Yorkers who have to see if there is probable cause to move the case forward. And he actually has a right to testify in the grand jury. Uh, we heard from the district attorney's office that they plan to present the case in about a week. So they have to let the district attorney's office know if he's going to testify. So you're saying the grand jury can be impaneled in a week? Is that my understanding? That? There's always grand juries ready to go. They're, the DA's office is just going to present their case in one week, and Harvey Weinstein himself could go and say, I didn't do these things, please don't charge me. And if the grand jury finds that there's no probable cause, 
the entire case could get dismissed. But we're talking about some serious charges here. And again, there's two separate <clears throat> women, right? There's one woman, uh, Lucia Evans, who's an actress that said Harvey Weinstein forced me to perform oral sex on him. And then there's another unidentified woman who says he raped her. So these kinds of cases, uh, I mean, we don't know all the facts of it, but your best guess, it's probably going to move forward. It's definitely going to move forward. And I don't think that Harvey Weinstein would testify at the grand jury. Well, I should let all of our viewers and listeners know that Rose McGowan, who has been very outspoken uh, against Mr. Weinstein and everybody in the Me Too movement, she tweeted, we got you, Harvey Weinstein, we got you. We are going to let you know more about that case as it unfolds. It's really breaking news right here on Law and Crime. But we want to take a step back. Let's go back to what we were talking about before our last break. Um, it should be noted that we were covering the Sean Harrison case out of Massachusetts. It is on break. It will be back next week about this reverend who is on trial for attempted murder. We'll talk about that more next week. Our focus right now is to recap another exciting case for you. It is the George Birch case out of Wisconsin. A man who was on trial for the first degree intentional homicide of uh, Nicole Vanderheiden, a young mother who died in 2016. Her body was found in a ditch three miles from her home. She was strangled, suffered blunt force trauma and sexual assault. George Birch, despite his DNA being all over her, despite cell phone evidence linking him to key points that night, including where her body was found, says that he didn't do it. It was really Douglas Dietrich, that Douglas, her boyfriend, knocked George Birch out, killed Nicole. When George woke up, he was forced to dispose of her body. That is the theory that was presented by the defense, and we will let you know later on in the program if it was ultimately successful. What I want to do right now is continue playing for you the testimony of Douglas Dietrich. Again, Nicole's boyfriend, the suspect that was originally the suspect in this case. He was ruled out by investigators, but he was not ruled out by the defense. They pointed the finger at him. So what we're going to play for you right now is some of his testimony when he talks about the last night, the last night that Nicole was seen alive. Let's play that for you right now. The last... We're learning a lot about the relationship between the victim and the victim's boyfriend in the Nicole Vander Heiden case. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network and Law and Crime on Sirius XM Radio. I'm Jesse Weber. So George Birch was on, is on trial, well, was on trial for the murder of Nicole Vander Heiden, the victim in this case. The person you were just listening to and watching was Douglas Dietrich, her boyfriend. The defense says that George Birch didn't kill Nicole, but it was really Douglas Dietrich. The night that Nicole, the last night that Nicole, Nicole was ever seen alive, she was having, a, look at this back and forth conversation, text message conversation between her and Doug. It was pretty heated. It was not good. And if you're sitting on that jury and you're listening to that, I wonder if you start to suspect that maybe Douglas Dietrich's hiding something and perhaps he did have something to do with Nicole's death. Let's bring back in criminal defense attorney Yosha Gunasekera. So they're arguing back and forth. These are really nasty messages between the two. On the stand, he doesn't seem to be that phased by it. But again, if you're sitting on the jury, I, I, are you surprised that the prosecution is putting this forward when they say or, are saying, look, Douglas didn't have anything to do with it. So why is the prosecution putting this for, forward first? So these text messages are very bad. They look very bad for the prosecution, but the prosecution needs to get ahead of it. In these type of cases, if, is a, if the prosecution doesn't bring it up in its case in chief, the defense is going to bring it up in its case. So it's better for the prosecution to bring out these text messages and kind of control the narrative earlier on. And that's what they're doing here. They're saying, look, he got into a fight that day. Douglas Dietrich and Nicole Vanderheiden got into a fight. There were some text messages that were sent that were regrettable, but that doesn't mean he killed her. What do you think of the defense's argument when they say, what makes more sense, a complete stranger killing her because they allege that uh, George met Nicole later on in that night after she fought with Douglas, after she left her group of friends, they met at a bar, she slept with him. What makes more sense, her uh, complete stranger killing her or a guy that was intimately involved with her? What do you see more often? You definitely see intimate partner violence much more often. And again, that's why he was the first suspect. That's why he was arrested and held in for 18 days. Uh, so he immediately is the the suspect that they went after, but it's 
not until we see other evidence come out, for example, the DNA of George Birch on her body, that the police is then questioning their original decision to arrest Douglas Dietrich. And George Birch says, look, my DNA was on her because I was sleeping with her that night. Um, you want to pinpoint my cell phone to different areas where I was that night? Yeah, I was with her that night. I was sleeping with her when, bam, I get knocked in the head by Douglas Dietrich. I wake up, Nicole's dead, Douglas killed her, and then he forces me at gunpoint to dispose of her body. That was the defense's case. We'll talk more about that when we get back from this short break. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network and Law and Crime on Sirius XM Radio Channel 109. I'm Jesse Weber, and I am guiding you through the George Birch case right now, a man who was on trial for the murder of Nicole Vander Heiden back in 2016. But the defense is saying, and George Birch was saying, that he had nothing to do with it that it really was Douglas Dietrich, the man that you were just listening and watching to. Douglas, who was Nicole's boyfriend at the time, was just discussing what happened the last night that Nicole was seen alive. They got into a fight, and when he came home, she wasn't there. Now, I want to talk about that right now more with uh, Yosha Gunasekera. And, and Yosha, I know we have to sign you off, so I'm going to ask you one last quick question about this. Um, he didn't seem concerned that she was missing. He didn't seem concerned, and he he just said he thought that she was intoxicated and perhaps spent the night somewhere else, which maybe was something that they would do when they were too drunk to come home. But it is strange, and really, the jurors are trying to evaluate, is he credible? Did he try to comfort her? Did he really try to help her, or is he just covering his own butt? Um, and so that's really what they, the jurors are having to determine. And now, at the very end of that clip, we're seeing the introduction of marijuana. Was he smoking? Was he not only drunk? Was he high? Could that have played a part of why he wasn't concerned at that time? Was he just too out of it to know? So it's going to be interesting to see what Douglas Dietrich continues to say. Absolutely. Considering the fact that this was his living girlfriend, she's not there early in the early mornings of the, uh, uh, that night. And he doesn't know where she is, doesn't seem to concern, but it's possible he starts smoking with the babysitter. So, Yosha, thank you so much for joining us. It was, very, it was great having you on. It was great to be here. Thank you. Now, what we're going to do is talk about that babysitter. So he was allegedly maybe smoking marijuana with the babysitter instead of going out to look where his girlfriend was that night. Let's play you some of her testimony right now of the babysitter. 